All right, welcome to Let's Read Mobile, presented by the Boys and Girls Club of South Alabama. I'm Mario Sheets, Director for the Center for Educational Accessibility and Disability Resources at the University of South Alabama, and I'd like to read you a due story tonight. The Juneteenth Story, Celebrating the End of Slavery in the United States, written by Aaliyah Agostini, illustrated by Sawyer Cloud. The story of Juneteenth started hundreds of years ago before it was ever celebrated. On July 4th, 1776, Independence Day, America broke away from British rule and was finally able to bask in the light of freedom. But not everyone who lived there was that fortunate. For what would span over 300 years, more than 400,000 African people were sto are stolen from their homes and made to help build a country that became this free America. Though some tried to fight back, they and many of their descendants were enslaved, brutally forced to work for no pay and denied their basic rights. They could not eat what they wanted to eat. They could not play when they wanted to play. They could not live how they wanted to live. And Independence Day did not free them. It would take 89 more years until enslaved people too would be free. Glimmers of freedom appeared state by state in the new independent America. Vermont was the first to free or emancipate its enslaved people in 1777. Slowly, other Northern states did too. Some people had long opposed slavery. Called abolitionists, they were especially active in the 1830s, fighting slavery's injustice with words and sometimes force. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? Asked abolitionist Frederick Douglass on July 5th, 1852. How can someone who is not free celebrate freedom? But emancipation stopped cold at the Southern states. They refused to free their enslaved people. Enslaved people's work made lots of money for large Southern farms. So in these states especially, freedom for all was bad for business. Abolitionists worked hard to end slavery, but in some states, enslavers, those who held enslaved people, worked just as hard to keep it going. Although Congressman Abraham Lincoln didn't always believe black and white people deserved equal rights, he did believe the idea of slavery was wrong. When he was elected president in 1860, seven Southern states did the unthinkable, unthinkable and broke away from the United States of America. They left the nation to form a new country called the Confederate States of America, sometimes called the Confederacy, where slavery would remain legal. On April 12, 1861, the Civil War began. Southern states versus Northern states. Confederacy versus Union. The North entered the war because they did not want the United States to break up into two countries. However, eventually the war became a battle to end slavery. As the Civil War continued, President Lincoln took steps to end slavery. On January 1st, 1863, he issued an order called the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring all enslaved persons in the now 10 states of the Confederacy forever free. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution was passed two years ago, or two years later. After the Civil War ended, official, officially freeing all enslaved people in the United States. Slavery had became illegal, but in Confederate states, such as Texas, enslavers kept the news a secret. The big state of Texas was far from where most of the battles of the Civil War were being fought. So no Union soldiers were close enough to make sure the new laws were followed there. 
Texas farm owners had crops to harvest and sell without enslaved workers who would pick them. The Civil War had ended, but enslaved Texans were not told the truth. They continued working because they didn't know they were actually free. The Confederacy surrendered to the Union on April 9, 1865. But it wasn't until June 19 that Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas. The war now over, he declared his General Order Number 3 from a balcony. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. 900 days after the Emancipation Proclamation, 89 years after Independence Day, 339 years after the first enslaved Africans came to the land that is now America, the secret was finally out. Freedom now belongs to enslaved people too. Newly freed Texans begin to feel the long delayed warmth of liberty's glow. As the news spread, they prayed, ate, and sang in celebration, though some were still in shock. Others left right away to search for and reunite with long lost family members from whom they had been separated by slavery. June 19 became Jubilee Day. It was their Independence Day. Starting in 1866, families and communities in Texas held the first yearly Jubilee Day celebrations. The next year, the Freedoms Bureau hosted the first Jubilee Day, held in the state capitol, and taught formally enslaved people about the privileges that freedom offered them. Jubilee Day festivities grew as the newly emancipated, newly emancipated used their new rights to earn money and purchase property. They bought land and built parks like Emancipation Park in Houston, their own spaces where they could freely gather in their best clothing to barbecue, sing, dance, pray, and play. At many Jubilee days, the Emancipation Proclamation was recited so that everyone could reflect on the words that had changed their lives forever. Jubilee Day became Juneteenth short for its date of June 19. Not all black people saw Juneteenth as a reason to hold big joyous events. Some felt their pain from enslavement would never be understood by younger generations who hadn't lived through it, so they hosted their own separate gatherings. Others tried Others tried to ignore Juneteenth altogether. Slavery was a terrible memory and they preferred not to talk about it. And even though black people were no longer enslaved, freedom wasn't the same for them as it was for other Americans. As the 1900s arrived, new laws spread throughout the South, limiting black people's rights and keeping black and white people separate. Called Jim Crow laws, these rules made it hard for many black people to have access to opportunities like good jobs and education. Black people couldn't even enjoy parks where only whites were allowed, forcing many Juneteenth festivities to be held far outside of town. Between Jim Crow and major events of the early 1900s, the World War I and the Great Depression Juneteenth began to lose its shine. During World War I, some people considered the celebration not American, a reminder of a sad time not worth talking about. And during the Great Depression of 1929 through 1939, people didn't have much extra time or money to use to host fairs and parties. But Juneteenth remained in the hearts of many black Texans. In 1936, after years of little attention, sparks of Juneteenth reignited with a momentary bang. 
The Texas Centennial Exposition welcomed more than 46,000 black visitors to a huge Juneteenth celebration to open its groundbreaking Hall of Negro Life, an entire building dedicated to famous black inventors, scholars, celebrities, and more. It featured huge murals illustrating the history of black Texans. Pride burned in the hearts of everyone who participated. As time passed, black people, especially in the South, grew tired of Jim Crow laws casting shadows on their rights. Many moved North and West for better opportunities, and some also worked together to fight back as part of the civil rights movement. Juneteenth spread as black Texans moved across America and shared their traditions in their new cities. In the civil rights movement, activists even made Juneteenth part of the 1968 Poor People's Campaign in Washington, D.C., a march for fair access to jobs and housing for people without them. More than 50,000 people took part, and many brought Juneteenth with them back to their homes around the country. In the 1970s, as America prepared to mark 200 years of independence, Many black people remembered Frederick Douglass's words and realized something. Their freedom was not 200 years old. For some, Juneteenth now symbolized their Independence Day. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Buffalo, New York, and more cities well beyond Texas, new Juneteenth traditions came to life. Families reunited, learned about their heritage, paraded, barbecued, and celebrated together. Their festivals grew larger each year. In Texas, Juneteenth festivities continued and some celebrations like Austin's, which had stopped for 25 years, were revived. And more than 110 years after the first Juneteenth, State Representative Al Edwards succeeded in making it an official Texas state holiday in 1979. Thank you for joining us tonight. Don't forget to watch us next time. And until then, let's read Mobile.